And we continue with the next talk, which is about learning-based video motion magnification. And it will be presented by Te Yun Oo and uh, Ronachai uh, Jaurenzi. Hello, everyone. I'm Te Yun Oo from MIT. Today, I'm going to talk about learning-based video motion magnification. And this is joint to work with uh, Tiam Jaurenzi and Chang Yen Kim, Mohamed El Garib, and Fred Durand, and Bill Freeman, and Boite Matsushi. I will present the first half of this talk, and the other half will be presented by Tiam. OK, let's get started. Uh, everything around us is moving. However, the some movements are very small uh, that we cannot see by naked eyes. So video motion magnification is a technique to magnify such soft motion in a video and make them visible to us. This technique has uh, several potential and uh, interesting applications, to name a few, uh, non-invasive health monitoring and the structural health monitoring, and so on. To explain how magnification uh, techniques work, Let's consider this simple example. The here, motion of the 1D video I uh, is represented by displacement delta. And the motion magnified video is generated by the scaling the displacement delta, which gives us the end result I tilde. Prior art manipulate the handcrafted features through the classical signal processing techniques. Uh, usually, these measure magnifications are divided into the spatial decomposition and the temporal filtering and reconstruction. To manipulate the displacement delta, we have to extract the displacement uh, first by some motion analysis. And given the delta, we can magnify the video with the scaling the motion and adding it back to original sequence and then reconstruct to have magnified video. In prior art, the pulling out the motion information has been done by spatial decomposition and the temporal filtering. For this, Wu et al. used the first order of Taylor approximation, and Wada et al. used the Fourier theory uh, and represent the displacement by phase. Uh, even though prior art, oh, so even though prior art generate the good result, they require careful hand designing of each block. So, for example. Noise is a serious problem that can overshadow the motion of the interest. So in prior art, uh, it must be removed, removed in the post-processing step. So in addition, uh, current techniques can only handle the pure translation motion uh, without the occlusion nor parallax. So this produces artifacts near the object boundary. So these problems motivate us to develop a better representation for motion magnification in a learning-based way. Uh, solving this problem with the learning-based approach has a number of challenges. First, we don't have the real-world data for training, because it doesn't exist in many cases and is very hard to obtain on a large scale. Second, the small motion can be easily computed with the noise, so we need to be extra careful here. And understanding full aspect of the motion required to see long temporal history, which would be computationally complex. So taking into account these caveats, the designing model in a handcrafted way would be very challenging. In order to tackle these challenges, in this world, the first, we find a better representation for motion magnification in a data-driven way. And second, we propose the second uh, two-frame-based training, which is not only efficient to train, but also the generalizable to longer frame window during the testing. So last but not least, due to the difficulty of obtaining the real-world data, uh, that we generate the synthetic data with very simple uh, simulation. So with these contributions, we get several improvements over the state of the art, and including the better handling the object boundaries like this. So let's now have a closer look at the network modeling. Uh, in order to train efficiently, uh, we only use the two frame as an input and allow us to represent the motion uh, by simple two frame subtraction. So it is easy the difficulty of generating the synthetic data and the modeling the architecture. Our network is uh, simple. Uh, in analogy to the WADA at all, our architecture has three main stage, encoder, and uh, manipulator, and the decoder. And the encoder returns a shame representation of the input. Then the manipulator measures the temporal difference between the shape, and it is manipulated by adding back to the original shape representation with the scaling. 
uh, the main assumption behind of this architecture is uh, modeling the velocity as the finite difference of the positions. And it's also worth mentioning that all the arithmetic operations in the manipulator process each pixel independently. Additionally, directly transferring the texture information helps to prevent the color magnification but preserving the constant color as well as it helps chain representation only focus on structural information learning. Uh, we simply use the error loss of the synthesized magnified frame. Uh, however, this is not enough to induce the meaningful representation of the texture and the shape. So uh, we use a simple method to induce the disentangled representation through the color perturbation. If two frames have the same placement, then they should have the same representation regardless of, regardless of their color. In addition, the, we impose the two frames to have the uh, same um, texture representation, even though they have different placement if colors are same. So while the proposed manipulator is very simple, the, it can handle wide variation of the magnification factor without retraining at all. Another benefit is that, by virtue of the linearity of the manipulator, the learned representation is linear enough, such that replacing the subtraction operation to the linear temporal filter at test time is compatible to our network. This allows us to select the much general temporal operations. OK. OK, so the next part is the data generation part, and the Tian will present the rest of this work. Thank you. All right, thanks, Tian. Hi, everyone. Um, so in order to train our network, we would also need a sizable data set as well. Um, and I want everyone to imagine for a second um, how we can collect a real motion magnified training pair of this uh, video. It would be pretty hard, right? And so for this reason, we opt to use synthetic data instead. Our data set consists of images uh, with segmented foreground pasted directly onto background. We use segmentation from Pascal VOC and the background from MS Coco. Each object has tr translational motion only, so no rotation or anything like that. And we randomize the directions and amplitude of motion for each object so that we can teach our network local motion. We use bicubic interpolation for subpixel motion, and we properly round the pixel value so that quantization doesn't kill our small motion. An example of our data is shown here on the right. Um, remember that we have only two frames for training, so this is a flip between the two input frames. To understand why quantization kills our uh, subtle motion, remember that videos are usually encoded with 8-bit quantization. Um, consider this linear uh, image with a sample point shown in red. If we move this um, image slightly to the right and resample the value, the value that are resampled won't quite fall um, on the quantization level. And when we convert these to integer, these get rounded down uh, to the same level, resulting in no motion at all. To remedy this problem, we quantize um, our value by randomly rounding the value with probability according to the residual value. This helps us capture subpixel motion more accurately. In order to make training uh, tractable, we also have to limit different parameters of our data set as well. In particular, because we are interested in magnifying small motion, we limit the input motion to at most 10 pixels. Magnifying with large magnification factor to produce large magnified motion is also difficult. So we limit the magnification factor to 100 times and also the magnified motion to 30 pixels. With these two pieces of puzzle in mind, the two frame based training and the synthetic data set. Let's look at some result. Our method preserves the edge better and it has less ringing artifact. Here's a frame from the crane sequence. Ringing artifacts are particularly pronounced for the face based method when processing strong edges, as shown on the right. Our method, by contrast, is trained end to end and results in less ringing artifact, as you can see in the middle. And here's a video version of our result. Another consequence of end-to-end -end training is that we have less blur. If you look at the boy's foot here, um, our, our result is much better preserved um, in the video in the middle, uh, whereas the uh, face-based result is completely blurred out. And here's the video result from the boy sequence. Notice that the foot is moving. It's 
um, quite subtle. We also perform quantitative tests on the noise robustness. For this, we use synthetic data so that we have ground truth to compare to. As a plot on the left show, our network, shown in blue, is consistently performing better than the phase-based method, which is shown in the red. In particular, the phase-based method quickly uh, drops down to the baseline level as the noise level increases. We have more detail and more result in our paper. To test the physical accuracy of our method, we obtained the hammer sequence from the author of Wat Wai et al, where the accelerometer measurement is available. We double integrate the accelerometer signal and use high pass filter to avoid drips. This resulted in the blue line shown on the right. As you can see, this line matches up pretty well with our magnified motion as shown on the XT slice on the right. Despite being trained on the two-frame input, our method seems to work with temporal filter. Here's a result of the guitar sequence processed using different temporal filter to select different strings. As you can see, each string was correctly selected by the temporal filter. This suggests that our um, uh, shape representation is linear enough with respect to displacement to work with temporal filter. Despite these successes, we observe that our method can sometimes overly suppress noise. And along with a small motion that we may have hope to magnify, this is an example of the eye sequence where the small motion is magnified properly on the right by the phase-based method. Our magnification shows little or no motion, except in certain occasions where the motion is large. We believe that this is a problem with temporal filter. Remember that our network was trained only on two frames as input. And the temporal filter used here is a 200 tap FIR filter. In a follow up experiment, we trained the network using five frames and five tap FIR filter as the input. And we observed that some of the motions uh, come back, even though the edges appear to be somewhat noisier. Lastly, in order for to understand what our network has learned, we approximate our encoder response as a linear filter. The top row shows the response of the texture filters, which looks largely like a blurring kernel. The shape filter in the bottom, on the other hand, shows a variety of derivative filters, including some higher order ones. This suggests that our network learns reasonable filters consistent with our understanding of how motion are detected. So to conclude, we presented the learning-based video motion magnification method we use two-frame training to simplify the training and make it tractable. And we show how we can construct a synthetic data to go with it. Our method produces higher quality and physically accurate result. It has less wrinkling and blurring artifact, and it is more robust to noise. Our method can sometimes overly suppress noise and small motion. But training with temporal filters seems to alleviate this problem. Thank you. And please come to our poster number two. And code and data set are available online at this link above. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions. Someone? No? I have one question. So assume you had real world data for training. Where do you think would your method get better than training on synthetic data? Um. I think I can answer that question. Uh, so even though we have the, a lot of the data, uh, which is uh, realistic, and uh, let's assume that, then we can try to come up with some neighbor approach to just stack the convolutional neural network. But uh, what this network learn have, have uh, many uncertainty. Maybe the data set uh, correctly supervised what this network should learn, right? So our man manipulator actually narrowed down the possibility of the one knowledge should be learned by the neural network. So that could be the yeah, answer of that question. Thank you very much. Go ahead. Any other questions? I want questions well. Uh, since you are learning end to end, I guess, so this is a full pipeline. So, do you think you can inverse the process and uh, do motion stabilization instead of 
magnification? Um, yeah, certainly. Um, I think in our small experiment, we also try to um, use a negative magnification factor. And indeed, we were able to do some uh, frame interpolation um, with, with these. Um, the limitation would be that because we design our data set around magnifying motion, um, if the input motion is too large, um, we might not be able to uh, capture that as well. And there is a related to the lip of field size as a parameter, I think. OK, any other questions? If not, then let's thank the speakers again. Thank you.